This city is corrupt. People will use anything to beat a Dark Souls boss these days. Magic, summons, levels. It's not the way Miyazaki intended. People need dramatic examples to shake them out of apathy, and I can't do that as Feeble King. As a man, I'm flesh and blood. I can be ignored. I can be destroyed. But as a level 1 runner, as a level 1 runner, I can be incorruptible. I can be everlasting. There's only one beacon of hope left to the downtrodden, to the hollow, to those who need to get good. I'm gonna show the people of Dark Souls 2 that their city doesn't belong to the magic users and people who level adaptability. You'll hunt me, you'll condemn me, set the dogs on me, because that's what needs to happen. Because sometimes the truth isn't good enough. Sometimes people deserve more. Sometimes people deserve to get good. And I'm gonna show them how Dark Souls 2 is meant to be played, without any iframes. You know it's funny, there are some people who love Dark Souls 2, and some who hate it. Some who love the Scholar re-release, and some who despise it, like myself. But every group of people has one opinion in common. A level 1 run of Dark Souls 2 is absolute dog sh cancer bad. Please like, subscribe, and consider helping out the channel on Patreon if you want more challenge run videos like this. Let's begin. The first boss is the last giant. This fight is a good reminder that Dark Souls 2 is slow motion Dark Souls. It's like Dark Souls 1 if it was actually Bioshock and your character was permanently in a big daddy machine rather than operating from a human. When you get hit against an easy boss like this, this one, you always see it coming a mile away and only receive damage because you were getting too bored and went for an extra hit. Oh, and the last giant is C tier, I guess. A boring slow intro boss that sets the tone for the rest of the game's boss battles. The only reason it's not in D tier is because it's the first boss, so I'm more lenient on it being mechanically simple. The next boss is Dragon Rider. Now this guy is a real mystery to me. He's a mechanically simple boss whose only challenge comes from the tiny arena you fight him in. You make the arena larger by pulling all the switches in Hyde's Tower of Flame. The odd thing is that the 1v2 multi-fight on the way to the boss is more difficult and mechanically complex than the boss himself. In fact, Dragon Rider doesn't even feel like a boss, just another normal enemy with an oversized health bar, D tier. Fortunately, the other boss in this area is pretty fun, Old Dragon Slayer, who is just a reskin of Ornstein. This boss is a fun combination of reactable and delayed fast attacks, with a butt slap explosion to spice things up. I like how this boss has some minor positioning requirements, as you need to dodge his attacks without rolling too far away to punish him before he dashes away. It's a good fight, B tier. The fact that the highest rated boss so far is a reskin of half of a Dark Souls 1 boss is pretty telling for the boss quality of Dark Souls 2. Next up is Flexile Sentry. This boss is okay. He has two halves, each with a different moveset. His sword half is very strong, so you need to roll around to his baton half and punish the endings of those attacks. If you take too long, the water in the boat fills up and eventually stops you from being able to roll, which adds just enough tension to make this boss not completely boring. C tier. It's alright. After way too many attempts of trying to blow up this wall to get the bonfire, we can now fight the Ruined Sentinels. I quite enjoy this boss. The main strat is to kill the first sentinel in a close quarters 1v1 fight, and then 1v2 the others after landing. It's a fairly simple multi-fight that works well for a challenging early game boss. Overall, I'd give the Ruined Sentinels B tier. It was around this time that I realized I forgot to fight the Pursuer. This boss looks really cool, but he is mechanically way too simple. He has one easy to dodge gap closer, one three attack combo, and a grab with a terrible hitbox. Of course, the grab is pretty easy to avoid by just circling right, so it's not a huge deal. Overall, this boss feels like he's missing a few attacks, so I'm gonna give him C tier. His appearance is cool, but he doesn't have enough attacks or mechanical complexity to match his presentation. 
Before finishing the Lost Bastille, let's fight another optional boss, the Belfry Gargoyles. Honestly, this boss is the best one yet, and it's just another Dark Souls 1 reskin. But this time there's three gargoyles instead of two. How original Dark Souls 2. <laughs> when you can't come up with good original boss designs, you sure can copy and paste from a better game, I suppose. I enjoy how this multi-fight has tons of positioning requirements, with different flying and melee attacks. Once the gargoyles are below 50% health, they start breathing fire, which allows the player to find even more openings. I can't give a reskin boss A tier, so I'll throw them at the top of B tier, standing proudly with Ornstein as two of the three best Dark Souls 2 bosses so far, which are both ripped straight out of Dark Souls 1. Sadly, my happiness with the gargoyles has come to an end, and it's time for the misery to truly begin with the Lost Sinner. Before we get into it, fun fact about Dark Souls 2. Almost every stab and overhead strike hitbox in the entire game is wrong by a lot. This applies to most of the normal enemies but especially with the bosses. The first torture experiment I faced was the Lost Sinner. Usually not a bad boss, but at level 1 this woman's stab hitbox is way too big. I had 9 iframes for this fight, but I recommend anyone else doing a level 1 run to get to the max of 10 before attempting this bullcrap. Rolling sideways usually doesn't seem to work because the hitbox was actually that ginormous, so my best strategy is to roll forward diagonal extremely close to the boss at the last possible second to avoid the giant stab hitbox. It's also really hard to find healing windows against Lost Sinner, the boss run sucks, and if you AFK after death they put enemies next to the bonfire to spawn camp you and increase your hollowing. In addition to the stab being crap, you also can't even punish her for the attack because she jumps away too quickly. Lost Sinner tends to go for more stabs the more passive you play, so my best strategy was to always confidently walk up to her even when at low health to trigger her easy to dodge and punish normal melee combos. Beating Lost Sinner at level 1 was physically painful. At a normal level I might give her B tier for having a somewhat fun to dodge rhythm to her sword swings, but at level 1 she makes me want to uninstall F tier. And just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, I was proven wrong immediately with the next boss, because as Dark Souls 2 will continue to show us, it can always get worse. It's time to fight the Executioner's Chariot at level 1. This boss is a mechanically inconsistent mess with one-shots, bad hitboxes, and two terrible boss runs in a row. It is so bad. So let's break down the boss into three parts. Part 1 is getting to the fog wall. Normally this is absolutely awful, as the normal enemies are overtuned and can catch up to you while running across the bridge. And there's an invader at the fog wall. And they often will kill you at the fog wall. But luckily, my friend figured out a way to avoid this. Basically, you jump to this platform, wait for a while for the enemies to back off or fall to their deaths, then you kite the red phantom away from the fog wall for a shot at the boss. The boss run is still ass because it takes too long, but doing this ensures you'll at least get one attempt at the boss every time if you play slowly. After entering the boss arena, you have to run in a giant circle while killing skeletons and two necromancers that revive them. The chariot will occasionally show up to run over you while doing this. Normally this isn't too hard to avoid as you can just hide in the little holes and tank damage from the skeletons, but at level 1 we don't have this option. We have to execute a very specific timing of reaching the hidey hole at the very last second to ensure the skeletons aren't able to attack us while we avoid the chariot. After doing this many times and killing both necromancers, we pull the lever and can finally fight the boss. Just like the Lost Sinner's stab, the horse's charge attack is similarly bull and requires a very specific forward diagonal dodge timing. Sometimes the horse's model glitches out and spins to do a random attack. Also, the horse spits out a one-shot poison breath attack. If you played a well-built game like Dark Souls 3, you may think that this is an opening like with Vort's Ice Breath, but no. I genuinely think the poison breath is random. In one attempt, 
I circle the boss to get an opening, and the poison clips through the horse's body to one-shot me from behind the direction of where it shot out the attack. What? And every time you die to this glitched out mess of a boss with terrible hitboxes, you have to do two boss runs for another attempt. I genuinely don't think I've ever screamed more while fighting a boss in any Souls game at level 1, and that's really saying something. At a normal level, I don't completely hate this boss because it's one of the more creative Dark Souls 2 bosses, but at level 1, it's a torture device. It's so bad, I don't feel comfortable placing it in F tier with Lost Sinner, so I'm going to put the Executioner's Chariot in F minus 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 tier. Now that I've endured two torture traps in a row, it's time to take it easy with more boring bosses. Skeleton Lords are next. The boss run is kind of terrible, but it doesn't really matter since I don't think I've ever died to this boss. The boss is just a somewhat fun and easy multi-fight. The boss isn't bad, nor is it worthy of any real praise, so I'm gonna stick it in C tier. It was around this point in the run where I realized that I desperately needed that 10th iframe before reaching Iron Keep, so it's time to take a detour to the Shaded Woods. The boss here is Scorpion Quelag. This boss is is like Quelag without anything that made the original interesting. Quelag was fun because of how she would spray lava around the arena and then explode, which forced me to think about how to position to both get openings while having escape routes from the fire and the explosion. Scorpion Quelag has none of that. It's just another mid as f uninspired Dark Souls 2 boss that doesn't even properly rip off the superior boss it's based off of. This boss manages to be simultaneously unoriginal while also not even understanding what made the original boss good in the first place. And the saddest part of all of this is that I'm still going to give the boss C tier despite being so unoriginal since it still manages to be more mechanically interesting than most other bosses we've fought so far. With Bargain Brand Quelag dead, I have reached the promised land and can farm farmers for the best armor set in any Souls game ever. The Peasant Set. It's the best because it raises adaptability so I can get that extra invincibility frame in my role. Unfortunately, after a lot of farming, I have still only gotten the pants. I still have 9 iframes, and I have killed every peasant until they stopped respawning. Crap. In order to get more peasants to farm, we need to use a bonfire aesthetic. And in order to do that, we need to kill the first area boss. And in order to do that, we need to fight Prowling Magus in the congregation. This is another multi-fight that is even more boring than the Skeleton Lords. D tier. Moving on. Now we've reached the Duke's Dear Freya. This boss is really boring. Since I'm playing vanilla Dark Souls 2, I can't use torches to make the spiders de-aggro, but the boss is so easy that it doesn't even bother me. Basically, you run to mid-range, bait out a laser beam attack, run around to the other side, and hit it in the face. Rinse and repeat. The boss is extremely easy, the spiders are annoying, and the boss run in vanilla is absolutely dreadful since you can't de-aggro the spiders with a torch. So overall, I'm going to give this boss D tier. With Freya dead, we can finally return to farming, and I have now acquired the Peasant Drip. Nice. I also realized after doing math that even if I get the ring that increases adaptability, I will never be able to get more than 10 iframes during the entire run. That's only one more iframe than the fat roll of Dark Souls 1, and two less than the fat roll of Dark Souls 3. In other words, I'm f***. It's time we return to the original path where we last defeated the Skeleton Lords. The next boss is objectively the best one in all of Dark Souls 2, and maybe even the best in the entire Souls series, Covetous Demon. I don't use this word often, but this boss is the definition of a masterpiece. He has tons of openings, well choreographed attacks, <laughs> and loads of positioning strats. Truly, a masterclass in boss design. For the ages. F tier. The other boss of the windmill is Mithra, the Baneful Queen. I usually kind of enjoy this boss, but after upgrading my mace for new game plus gargoyles, I sort of steamrolled her too fast. Maybe I'm being unfair because I killed her too fast, but I'm gonna place this woman in C tier. She's an okay boss that's a bit too mechanically simple, has a somewhat annoying boss run, and worst of all, 
all, you need to burn a metal windmill to drain the poison out of the arena. What the hell were they thinking? Traversing to the top of the windmill leads us to a lava castle for some reason, and the first boss here is none other than Smelter Demon. I'm going to talk about this boss in more depth in the DLC, but for now I'll examine the weaker variant. I think Smelter Demon is a lot of fun. In Scholar, his boss run is a nightmare, but since we're playing vanilla, it's much more reasonable. He has an interesting mechanic of always draining the player's health, so you have to pop life gems to offset the damaging aura. And the intensity of the fight is heightened, since the arena is so small that the player has to give up specific attack windows for healing. This can get a bit annoying if you get stuck on the boss as you can run out of life gems, which can force you to grind for more or pop all of your souls, but the first smelter demon isn't too difficult so it's not a huge issue. I enjoy the challenge of level 1 smelter demon, so I'll stick him in B tier. He's one of the more creative knights in armor. The Lord Soul boss of the Iron Keep is the Old Iron King. This guy has the mechanical complexity of a Mario fight without the jump button. The only threat in the arena is the hole in the ground, not the boss. He's a forgettable pushover, but also not terrible since he doesn't make me want to tear my hair out like some of the other bosses, so D tier. With the old Iron King dead, we can head down into the gutter. This part of the game really sucked since I can only use my mace while two-handing it, but I need a torch to see where I'm going in the dark. Naturally, this led to many, many deaths. After some suffering, we arrive at the Rotten. This guy has an awful boss run. It's genuine torture. There's a bunch of statues that shoot poison, and hand monsters that one-shot you. If the poison statues hit you in the face, then you are stunned for a very long period of time. The Rotten boss himself isn't all that great either. This boss is like Quilag without the creativity something I've now said twice. Instead of making certain parts of the arena have lava for a short period of time, there's just lava all over the place, and the Rotten has an explosion one-shot attack. This means that past half health, you have to always play extremely safe with positioning. I also hate how he has a second one-shot explosion attack with an overhead strike. The designers know that we're used to running backwards from the explosion, so they added a second explosion that forces you to run towards him just to kill the player a few times so they have to do this boss run again and I don't really think it's all that well communicated that running forward is the correct solution here. D tier. I hate the boss run and I hate how the game is achieving difficulty. Before moving on to Drang Leia Castle, we're going to sneak into the Ivory King DLC to get the best level 1 item for this run, the Vessel Shield. The boss blocking our way is Ava the King's pet. This is a mechanically simple big dog boss that is a ginormous health sponge because I'm underleveled and undergeared, and honestly, this pet is kind of a health sponge even if I was the correct level. I have a few other issues with this boss. The boss has a lot of get off me moves where the player is incentivized to just run away and wait for a punishable gap closing attack. I wouldn't normally hate this too much, except for the fact that Ava will spam his spell move, which drags out the fight while the fight is already too long because they're a health sponge. However, my absolute biggest criticism of this boss is just how blinding it is. It's like I'm fighting the Assassin's Creed loading menu. It's so hard to see the white on white, which just makes me dislike the boss more than I would otherwise. Ava isn't inherently a terrible boss, but there's just a lot of crap weighing the fight down. I'm gonna to place it in C tier. With the King's Pet dead, we can complete our build by getting the Vessel Shield and head off to Drangleic Castle. The first boss here is Twin Dragon Riders. Similar to Mithra, my weapon dealt way too much damage since I upgraded it to beat Ava, which made the boss a bit too easy. Even with that being said, I don't think getting a lower damage weapon would change the ranking much since this boss is just a bit boring. It's definitely an improvement on the first Dragon Rider fight, but the bosses don't have enough attacks to be very mechanically interesting even when there are two of them. I also don't think that the archer should have had reduced health from the first Dragon Rider, since that makes it even easier. I'm gonna give these guys C tier, they're okay. Up next is Looking Glass Knight. 
I feel very mixed on this boss. On one hand, it's a much more mechanically interesting knight in armor than the others we fought so far, but it's just another knight in armor with a few basic attack combos. I'm starting to get bored of fighting the same boss over and over and over again, but at least the developers tried to be a little creative with this one. You have to not only find openings after the boss's attack combos, but also ensure that you are positioned to hit his body rather than his invulnerable shield. Eventually, the boss will summon either an NPC or, if you aren't level 1, an actual player character to invade the boss arena, which is a cool idea. I'd say this boss is a good fight, but it's not amazing since the knight's melee attack combos aren't complex enough to set it apart from the other knights in armor we've already seen. Overall, I'm gonna give the Looking Glass Knight B tier. The next boss is Shrine of Amana, and holy crap, this ending stretch is more difficult to overcome at level 1 than any boss we've talked about so far. Everything kills me in two hits, and I refuse to use a bow to make it easier because I'm a real gamer. I actually felt so accomplished when I finally killed the last gank squad here, it was a highlight of the run. I'd give it B tier or something, I don't know. <laughs> I can't though, moving on. The Shrine of Amana boss kinda sucks, and it's mostly due to the boss run, but the boss is also boring. They just put a giant mushroom that breaks your armor if you hit it melee, so you have to use a ranged weapon to clear the way, only to have to dodge a bunch of spellcasters on the way to the boss. This heavily punishes melee builds by making the boss run way too long. The best part of this boss is how the Demon of Song is a funny looking depressed frog, which I like, but mechanically speaking, he's boring. If you stand near him as he comes out of his frog shell and then run away, he will usually do the same hand slap combo over and over and over again. Due to the awful boss run and mechanically boring fight, I'm gonna place Mr. Frogo in D tier. The next boss is Velstat. I always thought this was one of the better Dark Souls 2 knights in armor, which is why I was so disappointed to learn that he's just like all the others. Velstat looks like he's always preparing to continue his combo, which tricked me into thinking that he had the combo extending mechanics of a Dark Souls 3 boss. Unfortunately, looks can be deceiving. If you run out of his attack range after the first hit, he will stop the combo and it's always an easy opening like with any other boss in the entire game. Velstat appears to be a combo extending madman, but he's actually very similar to every other knight in armor we've already fought. Despite this, I still enjoy fighting Velstat. He has one cool combo extending attack if you're attacking his back, and he has a fun to dodge attack rhythm, so I'll give him B tier, just like all the other okay knights in armor. With Velstat defeated, we can get the King's Ring and proceed to Aldia's Keep. The boss here is Guardian Dragon. The best part of this fight is that the arena and boss are pretty looking. Fighting a dragon in a cage that Aldia probably trapped him in is a cool idea. Unfortunately, the mechanics are pretty boring. You hit the dragon's legs and then run away from fire. It's another boring boss, so D tier. Besting the Guardian Dragon reveals the lands he was guarding, the Dragon Eerie. The boss here is none other than the ancient dragon himself. In vanilla, you have to run past an army of enemies to reach him, and in scholar, you have to kill all of the large knight warriors or else you'll die at the fog wall. Either way, the boss run sucks, and most of this dragon's attacks are one-shots at a normal level and definitely a one-shot at level 1, and every time you die in one hit, you will have to do the horrible boss run again. The mechanics are also terribly boring. This may be the most robotic a natural feeling fight in any Souls game. The best strategy for maximal DPS is to hit his tail, trigger his tail smack, hit his leg to trigger his stomp, and then keep switching between hitting his legs and tail until he flies up. Once he flies up, you follow the tail to avoid the fire, and then hit the tail again to repeat the process. Sometimes he will breathe fire at his legs to one-shot you, so be careful of that. And that's it. 
a mechanically boring series of one-shots with giant fire hitboxes and an awful boss run. It's absolutely terrible, but it's also so easy that I didn't die enough to make me want to uninstall like with the Executioner's Chariot, so I'll just settle that to normal left here. Giant Lord is next. I kind of hate how as you run to this boss a giant cloud of mist appears as explosions occur behind you that force you to run forward, and the boss attacks you while you can't see anything which can one-shot you at level 1. Once you reach the giant, it's just another mechanically simple fight. You hit his leg, he prepares a sword sweep so you run underneath his legs to avoid the damage, rinse and repeat. He sometimes tries to slowly step on the player. Wow Dark Souls 2, repeating exact attacks from the very first boss. How amazing. I know someone's gonna defend it, cause technically this is the first boss, but since it's so far into the game, I think they should have added some trickier element to his stomping attack. Like maybe he tried to hit you with the sword at the same time, I don't know. It's not my job to make these bosses fun. If I fought this boss near the beginning of the game, which I technically did because it's the last giant, I might put it in C tier, but after so many mediocre bosses, I am beyond bored with this game. D tier. With the giant souls collected, we can finally fight King Vendrick. It's kind of cool that Vendrick is so lifeless and depressed that he doesn't even attack the player until receiving a lot of damage, but his mechanics are so boring that his aesthetic doesn't make me like him anymore. Vendrick is another mechanically dull health sponge with a couple easy to avoid combos that one shot you in case you mess up. F tier. Also I'm not going to fight Dark Lurker because I've never done it before and it requires humanity for a single attempt, and I refuse to start a battle that I cannot win. I'm sorry if this upsets you, please blame the developers. I've traveled far and wide, shitting on most bosses and saying they are either the same or worse at level 1. And with just the first DLC boss, Elena is so good that I can confidently say she is the first boss that is better at level 1. At a normal level, Elena isn't a very memorable fight. She summons extra enemies throughout the fight to help her and the enemies she summons are either some weak skeletons or Velstat the endgame boss. I always thought this was a stupid idea, as you can just get lucky with her summoning skeletons and then use your endgame damage to kill her quickly. However, at level 1 you are so weak that you actually have to learn both multi-fights to be victorious, cause she's gonna summon them both multiple times. Furthermore, at level 1 the Velstat Elena multi-fight is a genius twist on the 1v2 boss formula. That's not something I say often when talking about Dark Souls 2. In fact, there's no other multi-fight in the game that's this good. Normally, you'd think that the best strategy to win a 1v2 is to create distance between the two bosses to get safe openings. But Elena is a sorceress who is stronger at far range. In order to stop Elena from spamming her far range spells, you need to walk into her melee range and trigger her easy to avoid avoid melee attacks and explosion spell to get safe openings on Velstat. I really loved fighting this boss at level 1. Most of the hitboxes were fair, and figuring out how to solve this unique 1v2 fight on a weak character was a lot of fun. At a normal level I'd give Elena B tier, but at level 1 she's A tier. Defeating Elena directly leads us to the main boss of the DLC, Sin the Slumbering Dragon. At level 1, this dragon is the definition of a mixed bag. On one hand, Sin is amazing. At level 1, he may be more mechanically complex than any other boss in all of Dark Souls 1 and 2 combined, with the exception of Manus, who is my favorite Souls boss ever. Now that's some high praise coming from a level 1 runner, but there is a large but. But Sin is wearing a large coat of Dark Souls 2 bullshit to go along with the mechanical complexity. Sure, Manus had a few bad hitboxes, but most of his bad hitboxes could be easily avoided by playing aggressively. Sin, on the other hand, is a bad hitbox. Literally. So let's start with the good. Sin has so many positioning requirements for getting hits in that it's actually staggering. Standing by his back legs causes him to stop flying away so you can get openings in, but as he turns towards you he also does a claw swipe. This means that you have to get close 
closer to the tail rather than the front of his leg to avoid taking damage. Once Sin gets below 40% health, he will also breathe fire at his leg weak spot, so you have to look at Sin's face while attacking his hind leg to avoid getting one shot. Then, whenever Sin flies up, he will do one of three things. He can shoot a poison ball so you need to run away, he can charge you so you need to run left to avoid the giant hitbox, or he can breathe fire. The easiest way to avoid the fire breath is to get close to Sin as he flies up so you can run underneath him to avoid the fire. This presents a new problem. If Sin flies up and you preemptively run underneath him, he can land on top of you which is sometimes a one shot. It is best to be a little bit in front of Sin as he lands so you can attack his head after the landing. But this presents another problem, which is that Sin will sometimes charge you instead of landing with a giant unfair hitbox. This essentially means that every time Sin flies upwards, you are playing an intense game of positioning that can only be described as genius. But Sin has a few issues. Firstly, when Sin flies up, the camera struggles to see what he's going to do. I have to be close underneath Sin to be positioned correctly, but the camera feels very awkward when being pointed directly up. I also have to claw grip the controller while running to avoid the giant landing hitbox, only to barely see any of the dragon's model while doing it. This could be solved if the camera zoomed out every time Sin flew up, but alas, from Soft likes its awkward zoomed in camera against giant bosses. Another issue is that a lot of Sin's attack hitboxes are way too big to fairly dodge at level 1, and such a large amount of his hitboxes are straight up wrong. You basically have to assume that every hitbox is just way bigger than it appears to not rage quit when fighting Sin. Sin's AI can also get stuck in a flying loop, where he will have very few openings for a long period of time, which is obviously terrible for a boss with so much health. And on the topic of health, you need to either have two weapons or repair powder to fight Sin, because he will break your weapon before you can kill him. When you are presenting what is arguably one of the most mechanically complex Dark Souls bosses that has ever existed, it's important to make the extreme level of challenge fair. Sin wants to have his cake and eat it too. He wants to be complete bullshit like every other boss in Dark Souls 2, while also almost being as mechanically complex as Manus. But this just makes the experience of fighting Sin doubly frustrating. This is made even worse, since you can't appreciate Sin's mechanics to the fullest extent when you can tank through a bunch of his attacks at a normal level, but you also can't appreciate him at level 1 because a lot of those attacks are bullshit. So there's no perfect way to fight this boss. Sin has the potential to be an A or S tier boss, but his problems made the experience of overcoming him more annoying than gratifying. Because of this, I'm going to place Sin at the top of B tier. He's a good boss for the genius ideas behind his mechanics, but at level 1 I can't honestly say I had much actual fun fighting him. I mostly just wanted to tear my hair out. Before we move on to the more sh bosses in the DLC like the Grave Robbers, let's take a trip to Broom Tower to fight another amazing boss. Fume Knight. This boss is incredibly interesting. Phase 1 is like the slow motion version of Pontiff, and Phase 2 is like the slow motion version of Champion Gundyr, which are two of my favorite Dark Souls bosses ever. Phase 1 is like Pontiff as he uses a greatsword and a faster longsword to chain combo extenders together. He also dashes away a lot, making his openings quite small. Positioning strats are very important against Phase 1 Fume Knight, because his combo strings are so long that if you roll everything you won't have enough stamina for an opening. My best strategy is to hit Fume Knight in his back to avoid the combo extending attacks. I do this by circling right to hit him during the the ending of his longsword attacks, and when he uses his greatsword attacks I stand near his back right, run slightly left to avoid the hitbox, and then get an opening. In phase 2, Fume Knight becomes slow motion champion Gundyr. When you think he's done attacking, he will throw in a combo extender that is perfectly fit for you to get one hit in and then roll right away. Fume Knight's combo extenders certainly aren't as fast or aggressive as Gundyr's, 
but they both feel really tight and good to pull off, so I think the comparison is fair. Although I really enjoy this fight, I do have some major criticisms. Firstly, it seems a bit too easy for me to get Fume Knight in an AI loop of repeating the same attack and opening by circling right. It's almost like Phase 1 Fume Knight has a blind spot in his AI, where he spams the same longsword attack because his AI doesn't understand how to deal with my positioning. You could say that it's my fault for exploiting the AI, but I think it's the developer's job to make the AI not get stuck in a loop, no matter what positioning the player executes at melee range. Similar to Sin, Fume Knight is also wearing a Dark Souls 2 coat of jank. Some of his overhead hitboxes are bad, and his phase 2 stab is inexcusably terrible. I die here despite being close to his backside, because the air around the stab is a hitbox. I love Fume Knight, but that might be the worst hitbox in the entire game, which is really saying something when the game in question is Dark Souls 2. Another issue I have with Fume Knight is is how he will just start blocking or staying in neutral for such a long period of time, and at level 1 I've got nothing to do but stare back at him with my d*** in my hands. Fume Knight's coat of Dark Souls 2 jank isn't as thick as Sin's, but they do hold the boss back from its true potential. Fume Knight is so close to being an S tier boss that it hurts, but because of all of his problems I'm going to have to place him in A plus tier. He isn't quite good enough to stand tall with the likes of Pontiff, Gale, Manus, and others that I have given the rank of S tier, but he's so good that I don't feel comfortable putting him in the same tier as Elena. I'm just gonna say it right now. Fume Knight is my favorite boss in all of Dark Souls 2, and since he isn't S tier, that means I don't think a single boss in all of Dark Souls 2 is S tier at level 1, or even at a normal level. They all fall short. Speaking of worse bosses, it's time we fight Sir Alone. Now my take on Sir Alone is bound to upset many people, because this boss is a fan favorite, and I've always disliked him. Let me explain why. Sir Alone is a fun B or A tier duel. When he prepares his charge attack, my best strategy is to just run away because he seems to unleash the delay with inconsistent timings, and then I get a running light attack opening. When Alone stabs, I always roll sideways to avoid the bad hitboxes. His grab hitbox is terrible, as you all know but it's not too hard to avoid with good positioning and dodge roll timings. I also enjoy how he awards the player with openings after most hits, and that's about it. He's a very fun, simple duel that manages to stand out from the other knights in armor due to his aesthetic and his charged sword attack. Some people will say you should separate boss enjoyment from the boss run, which must be the stupidest thing I've ever heard. If I spend 90 plus percent of the time dying on the boss run for 5 seconds of enjoyment at the boss, then 90 plus percent of my experience was pure misery. And that's exactly what level 1 Sir Alone was. Pure misery. In fact, I'd argue that Sir Alone has the most inexcusably bad boss run in the entire series. This is for two reasons. Firstly, I was able to find fairly consistent AI patterns for the Grave Robbers and Blue Smelter Demon boss runs even if they completely suck, but the Sir Alone AI knights are so unpredictable I end up dying over and over and over and over and over again to different crap. And the second, more important reason as to why Sir Alone has the worst boss run in the entire game is because he was clearly designed to be most fun when played without summons. If I complain about the terrible boss runs of the Grave Robbers, Blue Smelter Demon, and the Frigid Outskirts, then my criticism will be met by an obvious counter-argument that all of those bosses are designed for summons. You can't complain about low-effort BS challenges that are all just reskin bosses anyways, because they weren't designed for a solo experience. And you know what? That's a fair counter-argument. Those low-effort boss challenges were not designed for my playstyle. But guess what? Sir Alone is the definition of my playstyle. He's a fair 1v1 sword duel, so why does he have a s*** 
boss run that's designed to kill me five times for one attempt. It's so dumb. I know this will be my most hotly contested take of the video since Dark Souls 2 fans love alone, but I've always disliked him. I think at a normal level, he's a fun duel that is ruined by the boss run. I'd probably give him C or D tier, but at level one, he's more than bad. He's f atrocious. I wanted to tear my hair out throughout most of this boss, because most of the boss was me dying in two hits on the boss run. F minus 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 tier. I'm aware this take will cause a bunch of people to dislike the video, but I don't care. There's no reason to hide one of the better bosses in the game behind so much crap. It's time to return to the Sunken King DLC to defeat a boss I missed. The Grave Robbers Gank Squad. Remember when I complained and said that the Rotten had a terrible boss run with a bunch of poison statues that shoot you, and getting shot can awkwardly freeze you in place? Yeah, so imagine that, but getting poisoned straight up kills you instantly, and there are more statues and more enemies with bad hitboxes on the boss run. If I die and go to hell, I'd like to think that it's just this boss run on repeat for eternity. Of course, once you get to the fog wall, it's not like the boss boss is any more fun than the boss run. You get ganked by three NPCs all at once who one or two shot you at level one. Taking risks is prohibited since dying once means it'll take multiple painful attempts to reach the boss again. So I would just run around in circles, slowly getting one or two hits on the arrow guy, then the sword guy, leaving bargain brand Havel for last. After many hours, my winning attempt took 19 minutes. When I finally landed the killing blow on knockoff Havel, I realized something. Even after defeating the grave robbers, there is no catharsis. My punishment continues to elude me, and I gain no deeper knowledge of Dark Souls. No new knowledge can be extracted from my victory. This boss kill has meant nothing. I have some videotapes to return, so it's time I leave the Sunken King and return to the only boss I've ever given up on in a level 1 run, Blue Smelter Demon. When I beat Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin at level 1 and got to this boss, I literally thought, you'd have to pay me to beat such a bullsh** boss at level 1. Well, now that I'm making money off of these challenge run videos, I don't have any excuses left. Still, some might say there's no reason to fight such a hard bullsh** boss with no summons at level 1, but I say that you can always be thinner, get gooder. Blue Smelter Demon is amazing, because he's one of the only bosses that actually has a really funny developer joke in it. Get this, you run through one of the worst boss runs of your entire life, where enemies literally launch spells that slow your movement speed and cause you to fat roll, while you have to avoid an army of enemies with bad hitboxes, so you think, Anything would be better than this, right? And guess what? The gracious Dark Souls 2 developers put in an alternative boss run. But here's the joke. The alternative boss run is somehow more bullshit than one of the hardest boss runs in any Souls game ever. So you have the choice between taking the hardest boss run ever or the hardest boss run ever. It's a funny joke, right? One serious trick for the boss run. If you walk around this curved angle while claw gripping the controller to run and face the Iron Warrior, his AI will usually glitch and run away from you and the fog wall. The fact that I figured out an obscure AI glitch to make the run back easier should be an indication of how many times this boss killed me. Anyways, after fat rolling to the boss you fight him, only to realize that his aura deals so much damage that even if you mechanically perfect the fight, you can still die very quickly to just his aura. And this footage is of me with the best magic defense ring in the game. Oh, and Blue Smelter Demon's phase 2 stab and overhead strike attacks are one shots with absolute hitboxes. I had to give up so many of my best attack windows to heal, and even the tiny amount of healing I get in is barely enough to offset the pain inflicted by the fire. I feel lethal, on the verge of frenzy. I think my mask of sanity is about to slip. It was around this point that Blue Smelter Demon started talking to me. I asked him, do you like Dark Souls? 
It's okay. Their early work was a little too jank for my tastes, but when Dark Souls 3 came out in 2016, I think FromSoft really came into their own, commercially and artistically. The whole game was clear, the hitboxes crisp, and a new sheen of fairness gave the game a big boost. It's been compared to Bloodborne, but I think Bloodborne had a few worse hitboxes. Yes, Melter Demon. Why are there copies of Dark Souls 2 all over the place? Do you enjoy the shitty game so much that you bought it multiple times? No, Smelter Demon. Is that peasant armor? Yes, it is! In 2022, FromSoft released this, Elden Ring, their most accomplished video game. But I still think their undisputed masterpiece is Sekiro, a combat system so catchy, most people probably don't understand its lore. But they should, because it's not just about the pleasures of conformity and the importance of the Iron Code, it's also a personal statement about the developer's Japanese history itself. Hey Blue Smelter Demon! <laughs> Try pre-ordering Bloodborne 2 now, you f***ing stupid bastard! You f***ing bastard! There's no more barriers to cross. All I have in common with the uncontrollable and the insane, the speedrunners and the level 1 runners, all of the stupid challenges I have overcome, and my utter indifference towards them I have now surpassed. My pain is constant and sharp, and I do not hope for a better boss run for anyone. In fact, I want my pain from beating Blue Smelter Demon at level 1 to be inflicted on others. I want no one to escape. But even after overcoming this boss, there is no catharsis. My punishment continues to elude me, and I gain no deeper knowledge of myself. No new knowledge can be extracted from my victory. This boss kill has meant nothing. Well, now that we've gotten that out of the way, there's only two DLC bosses left. First up, the Burnt Ivory King. Instead of a bullshit boss run, this time I have to murder hordes of powerful endgame enemies that two-shot me to get one shot at learning the actual boss's mechanics. And unlike the grave robbers, I don't have the option of backstabbing the normal enemies so I have to use hit and run tactics to slowly whittle their health down for a long period of time to get one attempt. It was here, when I died for the fifth time in a row to the burnt ivory king's guards without even reaching the boss, that I finally realized that maybe, perhaps, Dark Souls 2 wasn't meant to be beaten at level 1. My whole life, shattered before my very own eyes. A terrible illusion. The intended way to beat Dark Souls 2, the whole time, was with levels? With this, my reality was shattered. There is an idea of a feeble king. Some kind of challenge runner who never gives up. But that isn't the real me. Only an entity. An illusory wall. I'm out of fire. I no longer care about victory. I really wanted to prove to myself that I could beat Blue Smelter Demon, but when every other boss is a Blue Smelter Demon, I just don't care anymore. Just as I put out Smelter Demon's blue flame, my flame has also gone out. Could I fight the Ivory King for 5-10 to 10 hours straight, slowly use hit and run tactics with the beginning multi-fight to slowly memorize the boss's moveset until I win? Yes, eventually. Could I slowly murder every reindeer until they all despawn, and then kill the king's pets 1v2? Yes, it could take a day, maybe two, but eventually I would prevail. However, does it matter? No. Because these bosses are mechanically simple fights that won't provide any valuable experiences once beaten at level 1, and the boss runs were designed for high level players and in some areas, summons. If you throw enough bullsh** at a player, anything can be hard, but crafting a challenge that is both hard and fun, that is something only capable of the greatest game designers. And that isn't Dark Souls 2, not at level 1. The hardest parts of Dark Souls 2 are meant to be overcome at least partially as an RPG, not as a pure action game. So no new knowledge can be extracted from my criticisms. This video has meant nothing. Holy crap, I have never not cared this much about finishing a challenge run in my life. If I wasn't doing this for a YouTube video, I would have already given up by now. I'm only here because it would be anticlimactic if I didn't at least beat the final boss in a level 1 video. Although I suppose it's equally anticlimactic if I fight them, because the fights f***ing suck. The boss run for all three bosses is ass for no reason. You also have to equip the king's ring and watch a door slowly open every time you try to 
attempt the boss. They could have just kept the door open once you fought the boss once, but no. Someone is already typing a comment about why this is important to the lore. So to all you lore hunters out there, if there is a mechanic boring and annoying, then FromSoft should change the lore. Maybe Emerald Herald's broken condom item description reads, The final boss king's door stays open for 24 hours straight, once in the presence of the king's ring. Throne Watchers are a boss, I guess. Instead of one knight in armor, there's two. How original, Dark Souls 2. I've never seen that before. They have shields to prevent your openings, and they stick together way too much. I'd almost like this boss if the arena was larger than three micro penises and didn't have a cliffside to artificially inflate the difficulty. The bosses stick together way too much, and it takes way too long to get safe openings. They also have hitboxes, because why wouldn't they? C tier, I guess, I don't know, I don't care anymore, this game is so bad at level 1. Nishandra's up next. Oh boy Nishandra, what a boss. She's only slightly more mechanically complex than the first boss in the game. What poetry, to make the end like the beginning. So get this, the complex level 1 strat is to run away, trigger her beam attack, hit her, and then run away again. Truly brilliant boss design, meant to be an incredible end to an incredible roster of boss battles. F tier. Whenever you think Dark Souls 2 can't set the bar for boss design any lower, they always find a way. And they won't stop, because they patched in a third final boss a year after the game's release that somehow manages to be worse than the Chandra. How are they this terrible at designing the game? Shouldn't the ending be cool to leave a good lasting impression? I regret killing Vendrick. It wasn't worth the boredom that is level 1 Althea. My god, I just want the boredom to be over. I genuinely almost gave up on the level 1 run right here just because of how boring this boss is. I'm not even going to explain his mechanics because there's nothing to explain. And why does a boss this boring have so much f***ing health? F tier. Looking back on it now, it's kind of funny. When I first started this channel, I wasn't even going to cover Dark Souls 2. I was focusing on completing challenge runs and making them into videos, and I didn't really want to do a challenge run for Dark Souls 2, so I was just gonna skip it. But then I went and tried to play Scholar again for the first time in 7 or 8 years, and I realized that it was so terrible I had to make a video on the game itself, not even as a challenge run video. One of my least favorite games of all time. Then I played vanilla at a normal level and I realized that the original version was actually not bad at all. Not amazing, but not terrible by any stretch of the imagination. Those videos ended up performing very well, and I almost never made a single one in the first place. This Dark Souls 2 level 1 run is going to mark the end of my suffering with this game. Standing here now in Majula, looking out to the ocean, all I feel is nostalgia and sadness. I shared so many memories with the world of Drangleic, some bad, some good, and some were positively psychotic. But now that it's all behind me, a part of me is sad that it's all finally over. Although I'm sad that this long journey has finally come to an end, there are better adventures that still await us in future videos. There are still four Soulsborne level 1 videos I've yet to create, and three challenge runs I've yet to attempt. I hope to see you all there. For now, this is goodbye.